Well, we spent a lot of years here, but it's such a privilege to be welcomed back. And you don't know what that means to a pastor, to be welcomed. I like, well, I liked all three of those songs. All, well, all four. But anyway, um, I thought of the last one about there's something about that name. And there is something about that name. I was thinking, proof. 30 years ago, we went to the Promise Keepers Washington, D.C. gathering with uh, about three and a half million of our closest friends, you know. <laughs> it was an amazing place, an amazing time to be there. They estimated, if you listen to secular press, ABC, CBS, NBC, there were only a couple hundred thousand. But when you listen to those that did the actual satellite, and the way they, they test that, they take a satellite shot with like a 100 by 100 foot grid, count all the heads in that grid. And then they multiply that by all the other grids. Well, the best estimates were three and a half million people. So three and a half million men gathered there in the mall between the Washington Monument and the Capitol building. The leader got up front and said, when I count to three, I want all of you to shout out the name of the church you're from. So all of you are from different churches. So when I say three, I want you to shout the name of the church you are from. One, two, three. You didn't do it. <laughs> what church were you raised in? Okay. One, two, three. All right. That's about what it was like, but multiply that by three million times. Then the leader got up front and said, when I count to three this time, I want all of you to shout out the name of the one that saved you by his grace. And I'll tell you what, he counted to three, and when he did, to hear three and a half million men shout out the name of Jesus. I mean, it still does something to me. So let's try it. One, two, three. Who saved you? Jesus. Isn't that pretty plain to see? So often we argue the name of our church. So often we argue where we're from and who we're part of. Folks, there's nothing more important than the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is a dangerous text that I'm using today because it's so good that, if it, that probably every preacher's preached on it, maybe even recently, but if you have, okay, if you haven't. Um, but it's good, and it's one that's so vital, and it's one that has been key to our life and ministry. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. God, speak to us today. Not necessarily by what I say, but Lord, by what you say. Maybe in what I say. You speak to our hearts, Lord. When we just hear a verse of scripture, you speak. We ask you to do that today. In Jesus' name. Amen. As soon as Pastor Dave asked me to speak um, a month or so ago, um, I didn't have to pray much. I just said yes. <laughs> but I did a lot of praying about what to speak on. And the Lord just gave me this verse, and I just knew that I had to preach on it. Then I go to my Facebook account, and as soon as I do, Gary just happened to post that day, Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon. I thought, Lord, you're good at confirming things when we just want to make sure. As I get started today, though, I want to give you several one-liner observations I've learned in ministry over the years. Um, I've been in ministry a long time. I found out there's a lot that I know. But I found out there's a whole lot more that I don't know. Okay? I may not be a novice, but I'll tell you what. There is so much truth in God's Word that you can't ever stop being a student. Amen? 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 I need some of those occasionally. I found out something else, one of my one-liners here. Psalms 34, 25 says, I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I've learned that through ministry. I found out getting older came a whole lot faster than I thought it would. But I just love every phase, every, every level of, of our Christian walk. We pastored for 48 years. We've been retired for nine, but even going to the church in Florida, they stuck me in the choir, they asked me to do this, and had me appointed to the church board, and then a church of two, three hundred, that, that made me feel pretty good. But you know, you're never out of ministry. If you want to always be available, God will make you able, and God will use you. 
We kind of, uh, well, I'm going to back. I've been in ministry long enough to know this, and I've seen some ministers that when they retire, retire. They want nothing to do with speaking. They want nothing to do with anything ministry. And folks, I'm, I'm still not there yet. I'll be 77 in November, and I'm still not ready to stop. I just want to keep on keeping on. Amen? And folks, don't ever get away from that. Be willing to let God use you wherever you are and wherever you are and whatever, you know, anyway. Okay, another thing I've learned in 50-some in years of ministry is sheep bite. And if you don't know what sheep means, see me after the service, and I will tell you. No, we are all sheep, but sometimes God's people have sharp tongues. Sheep bite. Another thing I found out in all the years of ministry is that the devil will use anyone or anything or maybe everyone and everything that he can to take you down. It is the enemy's job to take you down. That's exciting, isn't it? especially for those of you that are getting baptized today. But it brings me to another point. You are of value to God. You really are. I'm of value to God. And God can and does use the most inconspicuous, seemingly unworthy things and people to do the most awesome things. Some of you have seen our Facebook page and you know some of our family members bought Linda and I a car. We needed one bad. We had no money to buy one. And we just said, God, I'm going to drive this thing till the wheels fall off if you keep it running. But at the right time, God moved upon my daughter-in-law and granddaughter. And it was to my granddaughter that says, Mama, I want to buy Grandpa a car. Well, how often do you hear that, especially in this age of high, high dollar vehicles? So God can use the most inconspicuous, seemingly, he surprises you. Another thing I've learned, God will make us able to do the task if we simply make ourselves available. Now, these, none of these are my sermon. This is all introductory stuff. God will make us able to do the task if we make ourselves available. The problem is that Satan knows this. And that is why he is so intent on stopping you, hindering you, interrupting you, sidetracking you. He will use every tool at his disposal to try to bring you down. And that isn't an exciting hallelujah subject for starting out a sermon, but folks, I'm going to tell you, you've got, when you came to Jesus, you got a target on your back. You may not like it, and it may not be easy words to say, but you, you, do. you got one whole kingdom that's against you, and that's Satan. And that's what I want to talk about today. That's why Paul said under the divine anointing in his letter to the Corinthian believers, 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And, you know, he'll play with our minds. The disciples were in the boat with Jesus How'd you like to have been in the boat with Jesus? I mean, would that be cool or what? Well, you are. But that's another sermon. But the disciples were in the boat with Jesus. The storm, the disciples thought, we're going to die. We're going to sink. So they got in Jesus' face, woke him up. How many of you like to be woke up from a good nap? I don't see one hand. We don't like being woke up from a good nap. But Jesus was having a good nap. The disciples woke him up from a good nap, cried in his face, Don't you care that we perish? Well, of course he did. When Jesus is in your boat, you're not going down. Turn to somebody and say that. When Jesus is in our boat, we're not going down. All right. Now say it like you believe it. I heard you the first time, but I didn't hear you the first time. Say it like you, I tell them, like you're speaking something into somebody's life. With Jesus in your boat, we're not going down. All right, that's, that's a little better, especially for Sunday morning, so thank you. But you're not going down. It wasn't, and this is another thing that I just saw yesterday going over these notes was, 
it wasn't Jesus' boat. Which tells me if he gets in your boat, you're not going down. Now think about that. A lot of times we preach this like he's in his own boat. The guys are just along for the... But it wasn't his boat. And a lot of times Jesus moves into our circumstances and our situations. He gets in our boat. He gets in our car. We're not going down, folks. We are not going down. All right. A couple more verses. First Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. I like that. But don't be surprised if things come at you. God wants us to be warned. He doesn't want us to be ignorant. Mark eleven twenty five. 25, And when you stand praying, forgive. And if you have, if you have odd against any. I mean, God cares about this whole package. When you pray, if there's something in your heart hindering the prayer, he wants it forgiven. Let it go. Leave it at the altar. And make it right with your brother. I shared with, with this with you probably 30 years ago. There was a, uh, somewhere in Pennsylvania, but a, a church started by a bunch of Italians that were out of the Catholic Church. They were getting filled with the Holy Ghost. And the book was called, Hey God. And that's how they prayed. Hey God, you save my husband. Hey God, you save my son. Her son Frank, and Frank wrote the book about it. But you know, what they said in that book was so amazing because on a certain Sunday of the month, they would take communion and they would all line up around the outside, the walls of the church. And get ready to take communion. As they begin to read the verses, people would literally run from one side of the church to the other to make things right with somebody they defended over here. Can you imagine, church, if God's people were so intent on making things right that they'd run up and say, Oh, Pastor Dave, I can't even take this cup till I make things right with you. <sighs> Can you imagine if that would happen in churches? And let's face it, pastors have been judged. Pastors have been gossiped about. I have for many years. Not gossiped, but heard about it. I had people judge me. That's part of the pastor's life, but I don't like it. And can you imagine if we'd get ready for communion and have people literally run to the pastor or run to the brother or run to the sister and say, I'm so sorry I've offended. You don't even know what I did, but I said things I shouldn't have, and I'm sorry. I learned that lesson a long time ago, and I didn't like it. It wasn't good. There used to be an evangelist in our organization, Denny Burton, great guy. He was saved when he was 16 years old out of the Mansfield, Ohio church. God saved him, God called him into the ministry, and he was preaching revivals at 17 years old. And then he went to Bible college, the same Bible college I went to just a couple years ahead of me. And I remember seeing him in Bible college, and things were a little bit different than I remembered. And I remember after service one day, one of the young ladies in the Pontiac Church said something about he's this, this, and, and, I, and I made a comment. And I felt so bad because I made that comment as soon as that service was over, I ran up to that brother and said, I'm so sorry. I've said things that I shouldn't have. Will you forgive me? Well, I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> but, you know, you've got to make things right. God put all this in his word as preparation for what I'm going to talk about today. Why is this so important? John chapter 10, verse 10. You all know it. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy what? Souls. Can I tell you the church has lost a few? There have been a few that have gotten saved and they got prematurely run out maybe by something that was done in church maybe it was something that was said in church some pastors have offended congregations and I know that's happened I know it's happened here but Satan wins a battle every time a child of God gives up I want you to get quiet I want us to think about that he's winning a battle 
And he's won a battle that's worth fighting for. Can I tell you, souls are worth fighting for? They are. Steal, kill, and destroy what? Families? Can I tell you? Satan has won a few families. There are things that have happened in families that are absolutely from the pit of the enemy. He's won a few battles. He's won a few families. He's won a few marriages. And they're worth fighting for, folks. Marriages are worth fighting for. He's won a few churches. There are churches that close. Somebody, uh, some st statistic says that there are like 2,500 churches a year that close down. The devil is winning a few battles over marriages, over souls, over families, over churches. And too many just don't fight. And when they don't fight, it means to me that they don't have the same value system that God does. I hear a lot of God's people talking about the return of the Lord. It is imminent. At the church we go to in Florida, they say that every service, the return of the Lord is at the door. I hear that. And I believe it. But I don't see a lot of God's people running to the altar, crying at the altar for the souls of lost loved ones. When is the last time you just got on your face before God and just cried out for a lost child, a lost parent, a lost brother, a lost sister? I made a vow to one of my brothers that him and I would agree together for my unsaved brother. And Linda and I pray at least twice a day, call out my brother's name in prayer because I'm believing God's going to save my unsaved brother. Amen? But we need to be crying out at the altar, church. We need to be crying out. If you believe he's coming again, if you believe he's coming soon, we need to be bombarding heaven for lost souls, for lost relatives, for, for family members that don't know Jesus, for the person you work with that doesn't know Jesus and God's put them on your heart and they're not saved and you don't want them to go to hell. Why aren't we crying out to God? We've got to be crying out to God for the lost. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to. I remember as a kid growing up in the Pontiac, Michigan church, and I just remember so often, it was a church of probably, well, Sunday school, they ran anywhere from four to 600 people, but for the regular services, two to 300 people. And I can remember a lot of Sunday morning and Sunday evening services, dear saints just laying at, at the altar with tears running down their face praying for their sons, praying for their daughters, praying for loved ones that don't know Jesus. If you believe he's coming soon, folks, we need to be crying out to God for their souls. I don't want to give that battle up. I know the one that come to steal, kill, and to destroy, and I don't want to give him another soul. I don't want to give him another marriage. I don't want to give him another church. I want to see churches open, not closed. Amen? So, now my text. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. I'll give you a little history here. 25, 30 years ago, I was at a conference at one of our churches. It happened to be Springdale Open Bible, Pastor Don Fry, the pastor. But we had a, a conference that year in, in a great prophetic fellow that I know, a good friend, um, with a very unique prophetic gifting. His name is Bob Lofton. He prophesied over Linda and I. And, uh, and that's some of the early days of the outgoing prophetic speaking over people. And, you know, sometimes you're a little gun shy over it, but if it's God, I'm okay. But Bob Lofton prophesied over Linda and I. He gave a lot of specific specific details, things that he mentioned that both Linda and I and even her family, it was identified. I mean, it was, he was just so doggone specific. And it was just one of those things that had to be God. It's not like, well, I know a little bit of your history and well, I can think, I can guess the rest. This guy nailed it. They looked at Linda and he said, You've come from a unique family. 
that you are your family's best kept secret. <laughs> Folks, if you knew Linda's heart at that time and now, they, she just was a unique character. She had a grace and an understanding and a love. And no way anybody could have known. And other things were inferred there. I'm just trying to be careful. Um, but it was just so specific. But Bob Laughlin's the one that stood, and he turned to me and said, and Mike, I see you speaking before hundreds. No, I see you speaking before thousands. And I was pastoring a church of 30 people. And I'm thinking, dear God, how is this ever going to happen? You're going to take me from here and put me into another church where they're just going to be big? No, that wasn't God's idea. But for three years after that, I got asked by the managers of the local TV and TV station, will you be a host? Will you be a host? Will you be a host? No. And I had, I had good reasons why. I blamed it on Linda. <laughs> but I, it wasn't something that I was totally... Radio and TV is not my forte. It's not anything that I felt like I needed. But the first time I said, well, we only do ministry together, and, and I'll talk it over to Linda, and we'll pray about it. She said, you know, I don't really feel like I should, we should because we've always done ministry this way. And, and I, I agreed and went like this. <laughs> went back to the manager and says, no, nah, we're not comfortable with it right now because my, my wife's not really at peace with it either. And they says, well, some of our hosts don't bring their wives. They just host by themselves. I said, well, I'll go ask Linda. I went and we talked to her, and she said, and this is when she came up with, we've always done ministry together. I don't think we should start doing ministry separately now. And that's when I went again. But two or three different reasons over three years, and finally they said yes. And some of the most special memories I have in ministry is hosting on that program at TBN. It was a God thing. But Bob Laughlin prophesied three or four years before that, I see you speaking before hundreds. No, and he stopped. I see you speaking before thousands. Well, TBN at that time in the Stark County, uh, Akron, whatever county, Summit County areas, they had a viewing potential of, of, of about 1.5 million people. So what Bob saw in the spirit, I, I had no clue. And I think that sometimes, folks, how God can use us when we're of the mindset what can I do, Lord? If we're arrogant about ourselves, I think God says, I'll just set you on the back burner. But I, I just knew I had no ability to do that. I didn't have a talent to do that. I didn't have a burden to do that. But God said, that's what I need. I need you to come in and say, just say yes. And when I said yes to him, he did such a sovereign thing in our lives. And then before Bob finished, he pointed at Linda in the eye and said, and I tell you that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. What does that mean, Lord? <laughs> he kind of said, you'll find out. But no weapon is a prophetic word given to us. Before I even knew where it was, I knew it was in Scripture, but I didn't know where it was. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Many years later, Linda and I went to a national conference in Denver, Colorado. It was a church of, I don't know, three to 4,000 people where the conference was being held. And I remember one night the pastor, the speaker talked about pastors, and at the end of the service, he says, I want all pastors to stand. So Linda and I were sitting about the fourth section over there, the very back row. So he said, just come up, our, our men will direct you. So we didn't go where we wanted, we went where they told us to go. So they said, walk this way, and then walk this way, and then walk this way. It ended up that Linda and I were standing center stage, right in front of the pulpit, halfway up the steps, because there were like six steps going up to the pulpit. We were standing here, and he began to prophesy. He, he prophesied all down, everyone in line, just spoke over them and talked about what God was showing him, and then he got to Linda and I. And again, very specific. He said, brother, you're a shepherd. And one of the things he said is, you have been wounded by the sheep. 
Well, things had happened years ago. and it, it, Yeah, we had been wounded. We had been hurt. But he said, you've been through a lot. But I'm telling you, no weapon <laughs> formed against you shall prosper. And when you hear this spoken over you two, three, four times, I bring all this up today to tell you that God knows your life. He knows your situation. And he still wants you to know that no weapon formed against any of you can prosper. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. The Hebrew definitions, the word weapon, it literally means something prepared. And what it is, if it's no weapon formed against you, it's something prepared specifically for you. How many know that the devil knows what can take you down? Well, he prepares a weapon specifically for you, for a weapon specifically for me. He will prepare a weapon specifically for who you are and what you do if he can stop you and bring you down. And that's his agenda, folks. He wants to stop you. He wants to bring you down. So he forms a weapon specifically for you. And the word formed means formed for a purpose. Weapon specifically formed for this purpose. And I'm not going to give the rest of the definitions right now, but I just, I want you to know that the enemy's weapons are real. And the enemy knows what it takes to bring us down. And they are meant to take you down. And since this is baptism day, let me add this note. In some areas around the globe, before they are put under the water, they ask this question, are you ready to die? Here we say, are you saved? I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Boom. And if you want to go straight to heaven, we hold you under. No. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. We never did that once. I about lost Mike Runyon one day. <laughs> he was a big boy, 300 and some odd pounds. But, you know, it was good, and he helped me, and we got him back, and he got baptized. But the question is asked, are you ready to die? You know, it's bugged me over the years when so much of the TV broadcast about Christianity is, come to Jesus, have all your problems taken care of. Come to Jesus and everything is beautiful in every way. Folks, coming to Jesus, everything isn't beautiful in every way. Stuff still happens. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. But I'm telling you that when we come to Jesus Christ, he helps you through every situation that we go through. Six years ago, and you all know about this, so I'm not going to labor on it, but our son was, was murdered. And I battled with it. I... It's not an easy thing to get over. My son that grew up in this church with the kids of some of the people in this church. And we prayed and we cried and we said, Lord, I don't know how to handle this. And God didn't speak audibly, but he just spoke, you know, he spoke into my spirit that I just knew. I said, God, I don't know how to handle this. And I just heard the Lord say, will you trust me? I go, of course, God, that's a no-brainer. Then he says, no. Will you trust me? Well, yeah, yeah, God, of course, you're God. And then the third time he said, I'm asking you, will you trust me? And you know what? There was such a burden that was lifted off of my heart when I finally said, yes, God, I trust you. And then I knew that I knew before I thought I knew. But when I knew that I knew that I trusted him, he'd make everything okay. So rain falls on the just and the unjust. <clears throat> good stuff still happens to bad people, and bad stuff still happens to good people. Huh. But no weapon that is formed against you can prosper. Now, I don't want this sermon to scare anyone or make you live in fear. 
I want it to motivate you to just rise up to be what God wants you to be. Do what God wants you to do. We went to a large church in Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica. Alston Henry is the pastor, was. And part of the worship service in that service, as they got ready to, to leave, they started singing a song. We tried teaching it here. It didn't take off exactly like it did. In, but it is different in Jamaica with 1,000 plus people or 30 or 40. But they started singing a song saying, rise up, rise up, right hand of the Lord, rise up. Rise up, rise up in victory. Tread down, tread down the enemy. And you see those Jamaicans, they just start treading down the enemy's head. Folks, if you realize as a child of God, we've got the authority and the ability. In fact, we're, we're commanded to tread down the enemy. We're commanded not to buckle under the enemy. We're commanded that, that no weapon that is formed against us can prosper. It can't. It can't prosper. It can't prosper. I believe it is past time for God's church to rise up. And I'm going to say this the way, just the way I feel it. I believe it is past time for God's people to rise up with a prophetic anointing and start declaring no weapon formed against us shall prosper. I think too many of God's people have just let things happen rather than taking authority over them. We need to start taking authority over our marriages. We need to take authority over our kids. We need to start taking authority over our churches, over our families. Uh, a big shock in the church we go to down in Florida. I thought, this big church and a lot of you know, people that aren't hurting, but I found out that some in our church have children in prison. Some of the people in our church have children addicted to drugs. Some of the people in our church down there have people that are have children that are alcoholics. And all this is just festering in my heart. I think it's time, past time, past time. We need to rise up with a prophetic anointing and look at our families, look at our, our husband, our wife, our children, everything, and just start saying, no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. It can't prosper. Now you stop it, you get down, rise up and declare no weapon over our marriages. And I, 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 I'm going to touch on that for a minute. No weapon formed against our marriages can prop, prosper. I'm going to tell you what. I get a little sick and tired. I get a little mad. Of course, righteous indignation. Over marriages that I have performed ending up in a divorce. That just galls me. Whatever that means. It bugs me, folks. Marriages or kids that have been raised up in this church or, or people, families that you've known, families that serve the Lord that aren't serving God anymore. <coughs> we need to take authority. No weapon that is formed against us can prosper. Relationships fix them. Fix them. After the loss of our son, I just really felt in all our family relationships. I just need to tell them how much I love them. So when I talk to my brother on the telephone, we don't hang up that I don't say, I love you, Tom. Every once in a while, I'm a son-in-law. Scott will call me while we're down in Florida. We'll chat for a little bit. And before we hang up, he'll say, I love you, my God. I'll say, I love you, Scott. Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. I talk to my daughter on the phone. I love you, Cindy, and she'll tell me the same. I love you, Dad. Why is that important? The last thing that happened between my son and I, four days before his life was taken, I was standing in his driveway talking, just chatting about whatever. I said, well, Scott, I need to take off. I looked at him, and I said, I love you, Scott. He just grabbed me, hugged me, and said, I love you too, Dad. Folks, you can't buy those kind of memories. You can't. You've got to tell your kids you love them, even when they're stinkers. Of course, none of your kids are stinkers, I know. But you've got to tell them how much you love them. Even if they're not saved, tell them you love them. You might not love what they're doing, but tell them you love them. You love them. You love them. Relationships in the church. Too many have just kind of faded by in the by. We need to tell our brothers and sisters, 
I, I love you, Dave. I love you more. <laughs> and to see Nick down here at the end, I, I love this guy. He's been such a rich friend. Back when we first came here, I drove over from Navarre and sat in front of his garage. Rusty had put his knee on his chin on my knee, and we'd sit there and chat. I didn't get preachy. We didn't talk about the Lord. We talked about plumbing because that was his area of expertise. And then we talked and we talked and we talked. And I kept doing that quite often. And then one day he says, what time is your services over there? <laughs> it does this old guy's heart good because he showed up. And Diane showed up. And Jimmy showed up. And Wendy showed up. And Nick is still showing up. And not only that, he's bringing his family. <laughs> Maybe in 1983, I couldn't have gone up and said, Nick, I love you, man. <laughs> but in 2024, I can say, I love you, Nick. And he knows I do, and I know he loves me, too. Sis, good to see you. Folks, it doesn't get any better than this. This is what it's all about. But when we begin to get the mindset that no weapon formed against us can prosper, you need to declare it. You need to declare it. I mean, if somebody comes up and tries to gossip to you, how many would be bold enough to say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper? I think sometimes people like to hear the gossip more than they like to confront the gossiper. There's been too many times we've allowed the gossip, and we've got to deal with it. Oh, but the things I talk about are true. If you look and research the word gossip, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. It is the telling forth or the speaking forth of something that has no redeeming value. There's a lot of gossip going on in a lot of churches. And you know what? God's people need to rise up and say, no weapon formed against this church is going to prosper. There are too many people that used to go to this church that don't go here anymore because weapons have prospered. There are too many kids that have lost out with God. Why? Because nobody declared no weapon formed against my child can prosper. You need to stand up for your child. You need to stand up for your church. You need to stand up for your marriage and declare that no weapon formed against this child, this marriage, this whatever can prosper. It can't do it, folks. We've got to declare it. And it's got to take a prophetic anointing. There's one thing that says, there's one thing about just saying, oh, devil, get out of here. There's another thing about rising up with a prophetic anointing and saying, devil, you get out of here. We're not putting up with this. I'm going to tell you one more little story, then I'm, I'll shut up. Or, or I'll preach as long as Pastor Dave. In 1994, my son was getting married down in Franklin, North Carolina. He had bought a Ford Ranger up here. He had put the lift thing on it. It looked a nice looking truck. But he started having some, it just wouldn't start. So he's getting married in a week or two. So he took to a Ford dealer, spent $800 to get that thing running. Well, they got it running. Scott said he called me. He, called me specifically to tell me this. I'm glad for that kind of relationship with my son. But he called me one day to tell me this. And he says, Dad, I just put $800 in that truck. I'm getting married next week. I said, why? What happened? He said, I drove the truck over to here. This one field or something. I forget why he did it. And I said, well, what happened? He said, I went to get in my truck and it wouldn't start. After $800 in the thing. What'd you do, Dad? I got out, I kicked the tire, and I said, Dell, you get out of here. And he got in the truck and it started. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, we've got to rise up with a prophetic anointing and believe that what you speak can come to pass. You need to speak, Devil, you get out of here. No weapon formed against me going to prosper. No weapon formed against Open Bible Christian Center can prosper. If we begin to declare that every time, if, if you just walk in the church door, put your hand on the side of the door, just plead the blood and say, no weapon formed against OBCC can prosper. Amen. 
And you walk by your child and say, no weapon formed against my son can prosper. Walk by your sister, no weapon formed against my sister can prosper. No weapon formed against my brother and his marriage and his kids can prosper. No weapon formed against... You know what I'm saying? We need to begin to rise up with a prophetic anointing and declare over our families, over our kids, over our marriages, over everything, no weapon formed against this can prosper. The last part of the verse says, this is the heritage of the people of God. Anybody ever inherited anything? This is the heritage of the child of God that no weapon formed against us can prosper. You believe that? You've got to believe it, folks. No weapon formed against your little one, Stacy, can prosper. No weapon formed against your marriage can prosper. No weapon, <coughs> no weapon formed against your health can prosper. The devil will try to take you down by your health. No weapon formed against you can prosper. Do you believe that? Will you do it? All right. How many said amen? Will you do it? I want you to stand up. And I'm serious. I don't want you to play church with me. I'm serious about what I'm doing right now. When I tell you and you raised your hands and said, yes, I'll do it. I want you to go to somebody. I want you to go to a brother, sister, husband, wife. And I want you to lay hands on them. And I want you to rise up with a prophetic anointing and say, no weapon formed against my child. No weapon formed against my parents. No weapon formed against my sister, my brother. And I want you to declare it. Don't just say, well, he wants me to do this. So no weapon formed against. I don't want you to play church. I am serious as a heart attack. I want you to lay hands on people and say, no weapon formed. And call them out by name. No weapon formed against this one can prosper. Amen? I want everybody. You, you raised your hands. I saw you do it. No weapon. <coughs> no weapon formed against my child. No weapon formed against my marriage. No weapon formed against my health. No weapon formed against this one can prosper. It can't 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 prosper. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Hallelujah. No weapon, Marie. No weapon, Marie. <laughs> no weapon, Marie. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. I've received that. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. No weapon. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Hey, come on. That's good. That's good stuff. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. We can, uh, we can say that all the time in Jesus' name. That's our heritage. That's our inheritance from the Lord. Come on. So, so uh, let's say it over this, this body. In Jesus' name, no weapon formed against Open Bible Christian Center shall prosper. Amen. Amen. Now look. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We believe that. Father, and no weapon formed against the families of this church shall prosper. In Jesus' name, it's going to, every evil plan and intention is going to just wither up on the vine in Jesus' name right now. It's going to wither up on the vine in Jesus' name. Every, every evil intention in Jesus' name for every family, for every individual in Jesus' name. It's withering on the vine. In Jesus' name, Father, but, but what will be inherited is a double portion of the goodness of God, a double portion of, uh, oh, Lord, the, the, the lines are going to fall to us in pleasant places, pleasant places. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, Father, uh, those things that have hindered 
people for years, Lord God. It's not going to prosper, Lord God. It's going to wither on the vine, Lord God. And their families are just going to be restored, Lord. Their lives are going to be restored. Oh, thank you, Lord God, for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name. Ah, those weapons against spouses that are reaching out and trying to grow with you, but, but there's resistance from spouses, that's not going to prosper. In Jesus' name. Those hearts are going to be open in Jesus' name. Right now, hearts are going to be open. Oh, and they're going to get saved hard in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. That's our inheritance, Lord God. Father, you said ask and you'd give us the nations, Lord God. We're asking for it right now, Lord God. We're asking for the inheritance of children, of sons, of daughters, Lord, of husbands, of wives, of family members, Lord God. In Jesus' name, we want our inheritance, God. Lord, we want that portion that is to be manifest here on this earth right now in the land of the living. We want it, Lord God. Father, bring it forth in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God, that it will no longer be cut off. Thank you, Lord God, that it will multiply. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? It's a good word, Pastor Mike. Thank you.